Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the East and Western Learning Connections. I'm Yang Wang, uh, your host tonight, and the president of the nonprofit organization. We bring learning, communicating, and volunteering opportunities to the public, especially the immigrant community. Uh, tonight, we are very much delighted to have Harry Fine with us. So Harry is a prestigious paralegal specializing in helping both landlords and tenants. Um, how prestigious? In 2018, he was honored with the William J. Simpson Distinguished Paralegal Award by the Law Societies. So society, that is like uh, only one person each year. Um, congratulations, Harry. Thank and you. before before he ran his uh, paralegal firm, uh, he was the adjudicator at the Ontario Landlord and Tenant Board. Uh, so he uh, adjudicated uh, like who is at, was at fault, like how, what the remedies should be uh, solving the disputes between landlords and tenants. And there he was also appointed to be on the federal judicial advisory committee uh, to make recommendations to the federal ministry of justice to the appointment of uh, superior court judges. Um, and Harry often appears on the CBC, CTV, the Star, you know, all the media to give his uh, expert uh, advice regarding tenants and landlords' rights. Uh, today, do, uh, Harry will focus on the rights of tenants. And uh, in two weeks, on June the 4th, he will be focusing on the rights of landlords. And, and Harry also... He has met a lot of uh, landlords and tenants from China. So he has uh, developed some online courses, also in-person classes for them, uh, helping them to learn the difference uh, between the two systems. So he has also a lot of observation on how a culture difference plays a role in our understanding or sometimes misunderstanding of those rights. Uh, we are so honored to have you, Harry. Uh, thank you for coming to volunteer your time and helping us understand these important issues. Uh, thank you. And now over to you, Harry. Okay, thank you. And it's my pleasure to be here. So I'm a paralegal of 15 years after being a member of the Landlord Tenant Board. Uh, this is my website. Um, and you can see I do a lot of training for landlords because a lot of landlords just don't know the rules. And so there's training videos. And I started doing these a few years ago. Uh, and then I was contacted by a large WeChat group uh, of landlords. I think there were 15,000 in, um, you know, like 10 different groups or something. There were 15 different groups. And I did some one-on-one -on -one classes as well with the uh, groups of landlords, mostly from mainland China. And I ended up getting a lot of clients from uh, who were Chinese. And so I do a lot of business in the Chinese community. And I, um, today I'm in Montreal because, which I don't have all my regular technology here because I have a granddaughter in Montreal who's one year old on tomorrow. And even though the police said and the government said, don't go to Quebec, or if you're in Quebec, don't go to Ontario, I wanted to go to see my granddaughter. So uh, yesterday or two days ago, I came and a little nerve wracking because you get to the Quebec border and there were Quebec police there on the median at the border. And I thought, oh my goodness, are they going to stop us? But they didn't do anything. And so I'm, I'm happy to be here uh, in Montreal and to be part of this. So I'm going to, I have a PowerPoint and I'm happy to give it to Yang Wang uh, afterwards so that uh, she can give it out to uh, uh, people who are interested, um, 
who would like a copy of it, you should be able to see it on your screen now. And my presentation is going to basically follow uh, the PowerPoint. And I hope to take about 45 minutes for the presentation and then about uh, the same 45 minutes if we have questions. Whoops, if we have questions. So you're gonna hear me talking today a lot about the LTB and the RTA. And landlords uh, in Ontario are governed and really heavily governed by the province. It's uh, a provincial law, not a federal, not a municipal, because the province feels that, you know, being a landlord or being a tenant needs regulation because landlords have powers supposedly and tenants don't. And they want to create a system where there's some sort of uh, power equality so that tenants are not taken advantage of. For landlords that come from mainland China and who were landlords or tenants who are here from mainland China who were tenants, they see so many differences because it's not at all like what it was back home where it's very contractual, whatever the parties really agree to and the landlord tends to have more power and the landlord has more power to raise the rent or to evict tenants. Here it's very hard to be a landlord and tenants have rights and today we're going to talk about those tenants rights. Whether you're a landlord or a tenant you will get something from this because for every tenant right there is a landlord obligation and for every landlord right there is a tenant obligation so there's a lot of crossover between what you're going to hear today and what you're going to hear in two weeks if you're part of this in two weeks we're going to talk more about what landlords can do if they have problematic tenants but today we're going to talk about what tenants can do uh, to make sure that they are enforcing their rights and they understand how it's different here in Ontario than it might have been back in mainland China one of the people that I find most get disadvantaged and taken advantage of are international students from China because they don't know the rules and they're afraid of using the system and they're afraid of standing up to their landlords. But here in Ontario, you can stand up to your landlord because you have a lot of rights and you have rights because the RTA, the Residential Tenancies Act, is the law that creates these rights and obligations. And the LTB is the Landlord Tenant Board, which is a special court that the province set up just to hear residential landlord tenant disputes. And under the RTA, rent is regulated. Responsibilities of the parties are defined. What does the landlord have to do? What does the tenant have to do? Most important for tenants, the RTA protects the tenant and gives them rights to remain in their unit, really unless they're evicted by an order of the landlord tenant board. Just because a landlord may say, you have to move out, you don't have to move out. The RTA creates a system for evictions uh, if there are grounds for eviction. And of course, the Residential Tenancies Act created the landlord tenant board, provides it with powers and helps both landlords and tenants get justice. I might add that currently there, there really isn't a lot of timely justice because the Landlord Tenant Board closed down in March and it closed down for five months until August. And there were no evictions and there were no hearings because of COVID. And then it sort of closed down a bit some other times, including during the stay at home orders. Now everything's done with Zoom. Uh, all the hearings, but there's no enforcement of evictions right now, and there won't be enforcement of evictions until, uh, you know, COVID, the stay-at-home order is lifted. So for landlords and for tenants right now, it's a very confusing time. So here's what the Residential Tenancies says, Residential Tenancies Act says about tenants and landlords making their own agreements. And this is important, and I'll explain why. The act says that the act applies, an act is a law, the act applies to all rental units in residential complexes, despite any agreements or waivers to the contrary. Now, what does that mean? 
Well, first of all, when it says all residential complexes, it doesn't really mean that because there are some types of tenancies that the government doesn't get involved in. And those are primarily for you, tenancies where you're sharing a kitchen or a bathroom with the landlord or a member of the landlord's family. But basically any other rental is covered by the RTA. But what section three says is that the act applies despite any agreement the landlord or tenant might make. So you as a tenant may feel, oh, the landlord is powerful. He wants me to do this. He wants me to agree to a big rent increase. He wants me to agree to move out after a year. It doesn't matter what you agree to, because if it's in the act, the act wins. So you can't make agreements outside of the act, because the act is there to protect tenants. And the government's concerned that landlords have the power. So they've basically said, whatever's in the act goes. The Landlord Tenant Board, by the way, has an excellent website, an excellent call center. Uh, all their uh, brochures and their rules and interpretations of the act are there. They also have a good call center to answer general questions, either before your hearing or during your hearing process. If you have a question, they can't give legal ad advice because they're not lawyers. They're not paralegals like I am. And they're not retained by you. You're not their client. So they can't give you advice. They can't tell you what to do, but they can give you information. And that's often important. The Landlord Tenant Board is also the place that hold hearings. Of course, now they're all through Zoom. You don't always go to a hearing. Hopefully, you and your landlord can work out the problem. And we don't have time to talk about how the hearings work, but hearings are now heard uh, via Zoom. And there are applications that landlords can file at the board and applications that tenants can file at the board. So if your landlord is not happy with you, they can file an application. If you are not happy with your landlord because he's not fixing the toilet, you can file an application against your landlord. When a landlord files an application about you, it's probably because he wants you to move out. And that's called eviction. And eviction is scary because right now rents are going up so fast and if tenants get evicted, often they can't afford uh, a new place, another place, it could be a thousand dollars a month more uh, to rent the new place. But the hearings are held and the adjudicators, and that's what I used to be, the adjudicators make these decisions at the board. But remember this, tenants, if a landlord says to you, you have to move out, here in Ontario, you have the power you don't have to move out. You don't have to feel intimidated by the landlord because unless you're sharing a kitchen or bathroom with the landlord or a member of their family, you don't have to move out until the landlord tenant board says you have to move out. And even then you don't have to move out until physically uh, somebody called the sheriff comes to your door to evict you. So if a landlord gives you a notice, don't be scared. Don't worry. Talk to the landlord tenant board. Talk to a legal clinic. Talk to a paralegal like myself and get some advice because often the landlords try to get rid of you just so that they can charge more rent, but they really can't get rid of you. So let's talk about leases. The first thing that happens when you move in, in Ontario, you sign a lease. You and the landlord sign a lease and the lease is simply an agreement to live in the landlord's property. But things have changed and things have changed much better for tenants because landlords used to have terrible leases, misleading leases, leases with improper facts. Sometimes they had no leases at all. So three years ago, the government created a standard lease that every landlord has to use. So here you can expect that if you're renting a place, the landlord gives you a government approved lease that tells you lots of things. It gives you information so that you're not gonna get fooled by the landlord. The lease has to be used. Uh, there's also a guide to the lease in Simplified Chinese and Mandarin uh, and in many other languages. I'm going to send a copy uh, to Yang afterwards and she can give it out along with a copy of this uh, PowerPoint as a PDF. 
but the lease is important and it has lots of information for you. So read through it before you sign it. The law says that the landlord and the tenant have to sign it before the tenancy starts. The law also says that your landlord can't hide from you. A landlord can't just hide behind uh, anonymity and not tell you where they live or how to contact them. In fact, if the legal name of the landlord is not on this government lease and the legal address of the landlord, you don't have to pay rent. You can withhold the rent until the landlord provides that information because often landlords like to hide. If they don't give you the lease, you can make a request for it. And if you ask for the lease signed and they don't give it to you, you would be allowed to actually get a free month of rent until they give you the lease. So take a look at the government standard lease. Uh, look at the document I'm going to send to Yang and uh, understand your rights under the lease because you have many. Landlords can't just make it up. They have to follow the law and the new lease talks about the law. In Ontario and in all of Canada, really, the government believes it's important that rent be controlled, that you might make an agreement to move in paying $1,800 a month, but that the landlord can't just increase the rent at their will because they want to get more money or because rent in neighboring places is going up, or frankly, they want to increase it because they want you to move out because they don't like you. Rents are very controlled in Ontario. When you go to move into a place and you and your landlord negotiate about rents, at that point, it can be anything that you and the landlord agree on. Whatever is in the lease and whatever you sign, that is the rent. And the landlord can raise it up from the old tenant to whatever he can get. And obviously it has to be fair and uh, reflect the market. Otherwise nobody will be willing to pay it. But once you move in, once you actually have the lease and have the rent, rent is tightly controlled. It can go up only once a year, and it can only go up by the amount the government says it can go up, which is not much. It basically can go up at the rate of inflation. So you don't have to be worried that the rent is just going to skyrocket after you've moved in. Uh, the rents over the years have gone up, and you can see on the PowerPoint, 1.5% uh, in 2017, 2.2 uh, in 2020, zero in 2021. That's the first time ever because the government uh, figured with COVID, they didn't want tenants to have to pay more rent in 2021 than they paid in 2000. But uh, every year it's based on the rate of inflation. And I've got this chart for you. So you can see, it uh, gives you an idea of how the rent can go up uh, year by year. And when inflation is high, the rent can go up. When inflation is low, the rent doesn't go up. There is an exception to controlled rent. And it's important you understand it. The government wants to encourage builders to build new buildings. And they do that partly by telling builders that they can raise the rent any amount they want if they've built the building after a certain date. So a couple of years ago, they updated the date. So anything that was not first occupied as a rental prior to November 16th, 2018 has no rent control. So careful, if you move into a new house or a condo and it's, been not occupied until the 16th of November, 2018, there's no rent control. And what that means is the landlord can raise the rent to a million dollars a month after a year has gone by. So that's one exception. And I want you to be careful about it because it fools a lot of people. But normally once you've moved in, the rents are set, they're tightly controlled. And even if you move in a friend, even if you're using more hot water because you've moved somebody in or if utility costs go up, the landlord cannot raise the rent. 
The rent is whatever it was when you moved in, plus any rent control guideline increases. And they can't just tell you that rent's going up. They have to give you a proper government notice. And they have to give it to you at least 90 days before the rent goes up. So for instance, if you moved in on March 1st, they could raise the rent the next March 1st, but they would have to give you the notice before November 30th, because December, January, February is 90 days, and then it would go up on March the 1st. And this notice is called an N1 form. Sometimes landlords try to trick you by raising the rent and having you sign a new lease after the first year. This may not make a lot of sense to you because a lot of residential landlord tenant law doesn't make any sense in Ontario, but you'd never sign a new lease after the first year is over. Never. If a landlord says, oh, you have to sign a new lease, you don't. You only have to sign the first lease when you move in. And after that, rents are strictly controlled by the guideline. If a landlord says, I want you to sign a new lease, it's probably because they want you to pay some sort of higher rent more than the guideline that the province uh, sets out for that year. So be careful, never sign a new lease because after the lease term expires, the initial one year or whatever, um, it just becomes month to month. And that's one of the biggest misunderstandings about people that come to Ontario and sign leases. They sign a lease that maybe has a one year term. And I'm gonna talk about term later. And they think that they may have to move out after the year term is over if the landlord says they do. Well, you don't. And I'm gonna get more into that later. When term is over, you can just stay on month to month, technically forever. The landlord can't just say, well, the lease term is up, you've got to move out. So uh, rent deposits. When you move in, the landlord can say, I need you to pay first and last. That is first month's rent, and rent for the last month's deposit that they keep until you finally move out. That could be 10 years later, but they hold on to that last month's rent deposit to be applied to the last month that you live there. But there are rules to rent deposits. The only deposit they can ask you for besides a deposit for keys or uh, entry cards or entry fobs the only thing they can ask you for is a last month's rent deposit. And they can't ask for pet deposits. They can't add, ask for damage deposits. In a lot of countries, they allow damage deposits where the landlord holds on to your money to see if there's damage when you move out. It's Ontario, not allowed. The only money they can ask for is first and last. And they can only ask for one last month deposit. So if rent is $1,800, they could ask for $3,600 up front for first and last. They have your last month's rent, they're holding on to it, so they owe you interest on it. And every year, they're required to actually pay you interest on the rent deposit. At what rate do they pay you interest? Well, it changes every year. They owe you interest at the same rate as the guideline is that year. So for instance, in 2021, they have your deposit, but they don't owe you any interest because this year the guideline is zero. But normally they would owe you interest on that money, 2%, 1.8%, 1.5%, whatever the rent guideline is for that year. So uh, rent deposits, don't be fooled. Uh, there are rules and it's just one month that's uh, all you can uh, be asked for by the landlord and it's applied to the last month when you live there. Sometimes tenants get ripped off because they might have given a last month's rent deposit to a landlord and the landlord sold the property, but the tenant still lives there. And then when they wanna move out, the new landlord says, hey, I never got that from the previous landlord. Well, it doesn't matter. If you paid a deposit to your landlord, you get to use that deposit for the last month's rent that you live there. Rent can go up in a number of ways, but 99% of the time it goes up in this first way. 
by this provincial guideline, by them giving you that N1 form. There's other ways for it to go up, but they're rare. For instance, if a landlord spent hundreds of thousands of dollars fixing up the property, there's a special application they can file uh, for, an, for an order that they can increase the rent above the guideline. If you and the landlord, I'm looking at number four here in red, if you and the landlord agree to adding something like a parking spot, well, of course the rent can go up because that's a change in the deal. You don't have to wait for the end of the year. It's not controlled by the guideline. If you want a parking spot and the landlord has a parking spot and you and the landlord can agree that it's 80 bucks a month, it can go up right away on June the 1st and you can move your car in June the 1st if you agree on that price. So um, those are the four ways it can go up, but we're only gonna talk about this first way, because that's the common way, and that is every year by the guidelines. So what does a landlord do if he wants you to pay more money? He is not allowed to send you an email saying he wants to raise the rent. He can't even give you a letter saying he wants to raise the rent. Like I said, the rules here in Ontario are very good for tenants and, and frankly, very bad for landlords. It's highly regulated. If a landlord wants to raise your rent, the only legal way to raise your rent is by giving you a notice of rent increase. That's the N1 form. And they have to give it to you at least 90 days before the date the rent goes up. And they can't raise it more than once a year. And the percentage that they can raise it, unless you're in one of those new buildings after November 15, 2018, that was built after that date, they can't raise the rent by more than the provincial guideline, which as you know, is around one, 2% most years. They have to use the landlord tenant board form. That is the N1 form. If you're in one of those new buildings, then they can raise it whatever they want and they would use the N2 form instead. And the fifth rule for landlords, if you moved in the first of the month, then that N1 form has to show that your rent is going up the first of the month. If you moved in the 15th of the month and you pay your rent on the 15th, then the form has to show that your rent is going up on the 15th of the month. And if they get it wrong, if they don't give you 90 days notice, if they don't have it effective the first day of the month, if they haven't waited for a year, then the notice of rent increase is void. In other words, you don't have to pay the increase and you won't get in trouble. This is the N1 form. And it simply says that on February 1st, your rent will increase $37.08 a month up to 2097.08, which is an increase of 1.8%. It has to be the first day of a rental period. It can't be more than the guideline. And in 2019, 1.8% was the guideline. And they have to give you at least 90 days notice. Otherwise, they can't raise the rent. If they forgot to give you 90 days and it was only 89 days, then they have to give you a notice for March the 1st instead of February 1st, because if it's less than 90 days, there's no increase. This is the N2 form. It looks pretty similar, except they don't care about the percent because with an N2 form for properties not occupied before November 16th, 2018, the rent can go up to anything the landlord wants. So on February 1st, but they still have to give you 90 days notice and they still have to use this form and they still have to make sure they only do it once a year, but it can go up to any amount that you want. So that's rent. And rent is there to protect tenants. And rent control really does protect tenants. So as a tenant, what are your rights? What are your obligations? I'm going to talk about some of those rights and obligations. If a landlord breaches an obligation, that's when the landlord tenant board steps in. So for instance, if a landlord charged an illegal rent or charged you a rent deposit of two months or charged you a damage deposit, if a landlord interfered with your enjoyment or harassed you, if a landlord shut off your water, entered the unit without notice, changed the locks without giving you a key, um, removing the laundry room that you used to do your laundry in. Evicting a tenant because they say their son is moving in or they're moving in, but then they don't move in. 
And of course, a very big one, if a landlord doesn't repair and maintain the unit, the tenant files an application with the board and they're $55 to file. And these are the application names, T12356. All the tenant applications where you're upset with your landlord start with the letter T for tenant. All the landlord applications start with the letter L. So what happens if the landlord breaches an obligation that they have under the RTA? Well, you file your application, after a few months, although lately with COVID, there's such delays at six or seven months sometimes, there'll be a hearing virtually with Zoom at the landlord tenant board, and you tell your story to the judge. The landlord tells his story to the judge. And after the hearing, the judge decides who's right. Did the landlord really breach an obligation? And should the tenant get some sort of compensation? Tenant applications cost $55 to file, where landlord applications cost a lot more. Once you file your T1 or T2 or T3 or T5 or T6, the board takes over. They give you a file number. Uh, you get a notice of a hearing. And of course, the landlord does as well. And then you go to court. And if you win, depending on what the landlord's done, the landlord tenant board can award up to twenty, sorry, $35,000 to the tenant, plus other remedies such as ordering a fine against the landlord. Very briefly, here are the breaches that landlords sometimes do that are not allowed. The landlord collects or retains money illegally because only certain charges are allowed. Illegal charges, illegal, not legal, things like key money, that's where the landlord says, hey, I'll let you move in, but give me 500 bucks under the table rather than that other tenant. Damage deposits are illegal. Rent deposits more than one month are illegal. Charging you for repairs or maintenance is illegal. Charging you interest if your rent is late is illegal. And charging a deposit for keys and cards and fobs that's greater than the actual cost of the key card or fob. And if they do any of those things, you as the tenant can file a T1 application. On the other hand, there's certain types of money the landlord has to give you. Now, the common one, of course, is interest on the last month's rent deposit. If they don't pay you that interest, you can go to the board and ask that the board order that they pay you. If they charge you an illegal rent and you just noticed because they never served you an N1 notice of rent increase, you can file an application to get that money back. If you were going to apply and you paid a deposit, but then the landlord didn't accept you, you can file an application to get your deposit back because some landlords like to keep it. And there are certain times under the RTA, under the act, where a landlord has to pay a tenant compensation for eviction. So for instance, if a landlord is moving in to the property or a family member, or if a purchaser is moving in or a family member, or if a landlord is demolishing the property, landlords have to pay the tenant compensation. And if the landlord doesn't pay those things, you file a T1 to the board and the board will have a hearing and order that the landlord pay that amount that they have kept or that they have not paid to you. And you have to file that application at the board within one year of the time that that money was collected. I know when I say file an application, some people who are new to the country get nervous because they think, oh, this must be hard. My language issue is going to be a problem. Uh, I don't want to get involved with the government. I don't want to get the landlord mad. But here uh, it's, it's expected that landlords follow their rights. And this court will not just favor the landlords. The court will do the fair thing. And if the landlord hasn't followed their obligations, you can get satisfaction through the landlord tenant board. You can bring an interpreter if language is a problem, but it's important that you don't get uh, nervous about going and then just let the landlord uh, walk all over you. That's an English idiom, walk all over you. Another application is called a T2 application. It's a tenant's rights application for all sorts of different things. 
That one application is used if they interfere with your enjoyment or harass you or enter inside your unit without giving you proper notice or lock you out and throw your stuff in the street because they can't do that or cut off your utilities or discard your property. You file a T2 application. When you file a T2, there's all sorts of things after the hearing is held that the board can order. They can order that the landlord pay you back all sorts of rent, give you money that order that the landlord pay you money for things that you had to pay for, like hotels or food. If things were damaged or destroyed or thrown out because of the landlord, the landlord tenant board can order that the landlord reimburse you for all that. And of course, they can order the landlord to stop doing that stuff. They can also fine the landlord. That's a fine to the government of up to $35,000. And if the tenant says, your honor, I just want to move out of this place. It's terrible. The adjudicator can end the tenancy and let you move out without giving any other notice. And there's also a power to just make any other order that the landlord tenant board feels is appropriate. So tremendous power for you as a tenant to get justice if a landlord in some way interferes with your rights. But again, you have one year from the time the landlord does the bad thing to file the T2 application. The RTA says a landlord shall not substantially interfere with the enjoyment of the tenant or the people who live there. The RTA says a landlord shall not harass or coerce or threaten the tenant. There's a T2 application about interfering with services. That means cutting off water, heat, power, gas. And it says in the RTA, a landlord shall not at any time during the tenant's occupancy withhold the supply of a vital service, which again is hot or cold water, electricity, uh, gas, heat. The very worst thing a landlord can do is change the locks, lock you out. Is the most serious of all the things a landlord can do. If a landlord does that, they're in big, big trouble because the RTA says a landlord must never lock the tenant out or change the locks without giving the tenant a replacement key. And if they do, uh, the landlord's in big trouble. If they ever did that to you, uh, you as the tenant should, uh, and you have a lot of rights, uh, if the um, landlord locks you out for any reason, you can call the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, uh, Investigations and Enforcement Unit, uh, they can order the landlord to let you back in. The landlord tenant board can fine the uh, landlord up to $35,000. The landlord tenant board can order that uh, the landlord pay for your hotel stay and food. And they can even be fined by the provincial courts up to $50,000. So the first thing to do if you're ever locked out is call the government invest rental housing enforcement unit. They'll try to get you back in quickly, then sue the landlord. It's also illegal to enter into your unit without proper notice because you have privacy rights under the RTA. The RTA says a landlord can only enter in accordance with the act and they can only enter without notice in emergency or if they knock and you let them in. Those are the only times they can enter without notice. Now, landlords do have a right to come into your unit because they have to come in and check. They have to make sure you're not running a drug lab or that you haven't done damage or that you haven't taken the furniture out. They have a right to go in. It's their place. They have to repair things when they're broken, but they have to give you proper notice. So they can only go in if they give you 24 hours minimum notice and uh, 24 hours minimum. Uh, so they can give you two days notice, but they can't give you, um, you know, less than that. Uh, less than the one day. They have to tell you why they're coming in and they have to give you a reasonable window of entry. They have to give you notice even if they're showing it to a prospective new tenant. And if they're showing it to a new tenant because you've given notice to move out, they're actually allowed to show it without notice. They can just phone you and say, hey, I've got somebody. I got to show it to them right now. Get dressed. And they can do that as long as it's between eight and eight, if you've given notice to move out. So if they give the proper notice with the date, the time, the purpose, 24 hours minimum, they can come in anytime. 
They don't need permission. They just need to give you notice. If a landlord is prohibited from entry, they can evict you or they can call the ministry's rental housing enforcement unit and you can be charged. So be careful. If a landlord gives you proper notice, you have to let them in, but it must be in writing with the day or time and the purpose. It can only be between eight and eight and it should have a reasonable window of entry. In other words, not I'm coming in between eight and eight, but I'm coming in between 10 and 12. The T3 application is an application you can file against the landlord if they took something away. A landlord can't remove something that they gave you at the start, whether it's a washer and dryer or a fridge or a stove or parking or a washer and dryer or storage space, unless they reduce the rent. So if they take something away, you would file a T3 application at the LTB to have your rent reduced. And uh, the rent can be reduced for the time that the thing was gone, or if they took it away for good, the rent can be reduced by the board in an order permanently. But again, you have to file within one year of it being reduced. If the reduction is temporary and reasonable, so for instance, if the landlord is fixing up the parking garage because it needs work, the landlord's allowed to do that. You cannot sue the landlord if they're doing something that is temporary and reasonable. The last application you can file against the landlord is a little more complicated because it's an application that you would file after you moved out because the landlord gave you a notice called an N12 or N13 saying, I'm moving in, or my son's moving in, or the purchaser's moving in, so we need you to move. And you move, but they don't move in. A lot of these N12 and N13 notices are phony because the landlords tried all sorts of tricks. They want to get rid of tenants they don't like. They want to get rid of a tenant because the rent has gone way up and they would like to get more rent. So if the son doesn't move in or the purchaser doesn't move in or the landlord doesn't move in, you have a year to file this application and say, hey, I moved out for no good reason. He lied to me. And you sir, file the application of the board and you cannot get the board to order you to go back because the landlord may have already rented it to somebody else, but the board can order the landlord to pay you a lot of money. The landlord at the hearing would have to show that they acted in good faith. But if you make this application within a year of moving out, you can get all the difference in rent for a year that you've had to pay, all your moving and storage costs, and you can get all your rent back going back one year. And the landlord may have to pay a fine to the government of up to 35000 so for a landlord, it could cost $70,000, partly to the government, partly to the tenant, if they've lied and told them that somebody was moving in, but in fact, they weren't really moving in. So if a landlord asks you to leave because someone's moving in, but then they advertise it for re-rental, uh, they enter into a new agreement with somebody other than you, they advertise it for sale, they demolish the building, they try to convert it to something else, the landlord is in trouble and you should file that application. And there's a lot of money, um, I think I've gone over that, there's a lot of money that you can get. Finally, the last application for a tenant is the T6 application. If the landlord doesn't repair or maintain the thing they're supposed to repair and maintain, you file the T6 application because the landlord's responsible to keep the place in good shape. And that includes things like appliances, snow, grass, water leaks, roof leaks, plumbing, electrical, etc. And if the landlord doesn't do it and you file a T6, the board can order that you can move out if that's what you want. They can order that the landlord pay you back rent because you've been miserable living there. They can order out-of-pocket expenses if you couldn't live there. They can order the landlord to do a repair or they can authorize a repair that you did like fixing the furnace when the landlord wouldn't fix it. And they can order that you can take the money off your rent for any money that you've spent. And again, a one year limitation period. 
And you've got to file that application within a year. And remember, if a landlord comes in to do the repairs, you can't interfere with him doing the repairs. You can't refuse to let him in and then sue him for not doing the repairs. Um, so if a landlord breaches the obligation, you file an application, you have a hearing at the board, and the board orders a remedy. How much time do you have where you can file? Don't forget, it's whoops one year from the time of the landlord's bad behavior for you to file the application. I'm gonna go through the next part pretty quickly because we are taking some time here and I wanna have time for questions. Uh, there's a, an obligation tenants have that's very important. You can't just move out any time without giving notice. I wanna tell you briefly about the N9 notice and the N11 agreement. So you have a lease and now you have the standard government form. And on the lease, you usually have a one year term. Although you don't have to have term, you can just have a month to month lease right from day one. And a lot of people confuse the term, which doesn't really mean much, and the tenancy, which is the whole time you live there. Term is optional, and it's actually bad for landlords and good for tenants. But if there is no term, it's simply month to month. But the important thing to remember is if there was lease term, and I said this earlier, when term ends, you don't have to move out. The landlord says, oh, your one year is up. You don't have to move. It automatically becomes month to month. No need for a notice. No need to sign a new lease. No need to even tell the landlord. The law says that if a tenancy agreement with term ends, the term ends, but the tenancy didn't end, it's considered to have simply been renewed on a month to month basis with all the same terms and conditions as the government lease, except the rent that may go up if it's increased properly. Landlords like lease term because they think that tenants have to stay for the year, which they don't really. Tenants like lease term and they should because if you're in lease term, a landlord can't evict you for those reasons like family member moving in, purchaser moving in, demolition of the unit. So remember, you never have to sign a new lease. You don't ever have to renew term. And it just becomes month to month when the term is over. But let's say you want to move out. What do you do? You have to give notice. And if you don't give notice, proper notice, the landlord may sue you for money. So be careful. When it's time to move out, you give a copy of the N9 notice. You give it to the landlord with at least 60 days notice. And you have to tell them you're leaving the last day of a rental period. So if you pay rent on the 1st, and today is the, what, the 22nd of, of May, and you pay rent on the 1st, then July 31st would be the first day that you're legally allowed to give to move out without owing the landlord more money. So minimum 60 days, effective the last day of a rental period. It's a very simple form. Whoops, many tenants don't know about it. And then they get in trouble because they just leave or send an email. But here in Ontario, you can't do that. You, just like landlords have to use forms, you have to use forms. What if a landlord and tenant just agree that the tenant will move out? So you don't like each other. You don't like the place. The landlord says, go. You know what? You're not happy here. Go. And you say, okay, I will go. But you don't want to wait 60 days. So you say, look, I want to leave this weekend. I have a new place. Well, you can't use the N9 because the N9 needs 60 days. But if you sign an agreement to move out, it can be for any time. We could sign an agreement today, May the 22nd, that you're moving out tomorrow, May the 23rd. But this is an agreement. You both have to sign it. And if the landlord doesn't agree, then you still have to give the proper 60 days notice uh, if you want to move out. So use the government form. Don't be afraid of the form. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to open this for questions. Well, I see there are questions here. I'm happy to answer them. 
uh, yeah, maybe you you want to pick up those questions in the chat room uh, first. Okay, I think there's only one, uh, two questions here. There are two. Two yeah. questions. Annie says, my daughter moved into a unit without signing a rent lease since Feb 2021. Should we ask for a lease from the landlord with the landlord's warning? Well, first of all, Annie, if she's living in a place where she shares a kitchen or a bathroom, one or the other, with the landlord or the member of a landlord's family, then the RTA does not apply. But everywhere else it applies. Um, so, yes, so my, my, Harry, yes. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. <clears throat> yes, my daughter moved into the house with another tenant. So she has a suite. She has her own bathroom. Um, but the kitchen was shared with other tenant. Do we need to sign her? Okay, okay. so did she, did she move in the same time as the other tenant? No. Okay, so she is a roommate. And this yes. is a complicated topic. And nowadays with rents being so expensive and, and very often with international students, they come and they move in with someone they don't even know. Or, you know, there are two people living there, one moves out, now your daughter moves in, there's two. Mm -hmm. Most people have no rights because they didn't have a lease with the landlord. They're only there because the other tenant let them move in. The landlord, let's say the rent was 1800 and two tenants were each paying 900 mm -hmm. And one of those tenants moved out. But Annie, then your daughter moved in. Even if your daughter hadn't moved in, the landlord is still entitled to 1800 Even though the first tenant moved out, the landlord's still entitled to 1800 So if the tenant brought in your daughter as a roommate... Um, no, the situation is we rent directly, we pay directly to the landlord. Yeah, but, but you weren't... Is it a rooming house situation? Um, it's a house. It's a big house. Does the tenant share space with anybody? Mm, just uh, with the roommate, I mean. Yeah, only two families. Like uh, one family, uh, they, the lady, she's a tenant too. She has two daughters. And, and my but, daughter, she's alone there. So they share the kitchen. On their, does, uh, the, first does, the, does the landlord live in the house? No, the landlord okay. moved out. My daughter moved in. Okay. Your, the, what worries me is not so much that she doesn't have a lease, but it worries me that the landlord is going to take advantage of her in other ways, like trying to kick her out, etc. If the landlord doesn't live there, mm -hmm. and your daughter moved in, and she's renting space with her own bedroom, even if she's sharing other space, she has protections under the RTA and she's entitled to a, a lease. But you bring up an interesting question, uh, sort of a different slant to the question. What should a tenant do if everything is going okay and they mm -hmm. love the place they live, but the landlord's not following the rules? The tenant has to decide do I want to get into a fight with the landlord? Yes, you'll have protections, but you don't want to start fighting for no reason. So mm -hmm. today, your daughter doesn't have a lease. Okay, not a big deal. But mm -hmm. what happens if next year the landlord says you owe me $300 more or she says you have to leave? That's when your daughter needs to understand she has rights and mm -hmm. she, she needs um the, the issue is my daughter is under 18. She's not the, like legally, she should not render. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. In Ontario, the uh -huh. law says that people 16 and 17 can sign a contract oh. if they're not under parental control. So if mm -hmm. she's living independently, mm -hmm. it's uh, the landlord cannot refuse to sign the agreement with her. And, and remember, that contract that your daughter signs is binding on your daughter. So if your daughter didn't pay rent, the landlord could, could sue her for the money. Mm -hmm. I see. So we are, we should be able to get a lease to be signed, right? Well, I, I don't know if she should bother. Does she want to have a fight today? 
or does she only want to have a fight when it comes time with the landlord says you have to get out? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's, that's a decision of the you have to make. Yeah, do I um can I sign for her? Like uh, if she lives there, I ask the landlord to give me a lease I signed on behalf of her. Oh, wait a minute, D did you sign a lease? No. Okay. If if the landlord, if you haven't signed as a guarantor already, mm -hmm. then then why do it? The landlord let her move in. Just mm -hmm. you would be yeah. you, would, you would be crazy to do mm -hmm. it now. Why? If she was going to move somewhere else, and the landlord said, "You know, I really like her, but she's not making much money. Does your mother have money? Will she sign as a guarantor?" Then you can decide to do that for your daughter, but. Where she is now, she's already there. The mm -hmm. landlord's already made the deal, and, and that's it. I just worry about if next year they're going to increase their... If they do, then mm -hmm. and they don't give you an N1 form, then you, you talk to me, okay? Oh, I see. So it doesn't so matter if there is... To, anybody who wants to connect with me mm -hmm. um, and, and just ask me a quick question. I don't want you to take advantage of my... Uh, of my yeah. time, but I'm happy I'm to help people with quick mm -hmm. questions. So uh, you suggest we don't with, need a lease. If you want to connect with me on WeChat, I'm at Harry underscore fine. Mm -hmm. so if you have a quick question, you can ask me there. I have to go on to Ryan. Sure. Thank you. A question. Ryan says, and this is a common one. My landlord sent me an N12. And I surely know, uh, just want to rent the house to other people for a higher rent. Do you have to move out? Um, what, what I tell tenants, Ryan, when they say the landlord served me an N5, I say two words, don't move. If you think the landlord is just trying to get more rent, don't move. You don't have to move. The landlord can file an application if he wants based on the N12, the application is called an L2. The landlord can go to the board with you. Uh, who, who does the landlord say is moving in? Uh, the landlord, first time landlord told me she wa he want to sell the house. Okay, when you sell the house, the tenancy does not end, period. Yeah, and then he told me he want her, his Saw moved in and give me a and okay. but it's all it's all crap. Trust me, Brian. It's all crap. First of all, selling a house doesn't end the tenancy. The tenant just stays there for the new landlord. If the landlord's son is moving in, if the landlord is moving in, if a purchaser is moving in, they can give you an N twelve, but you don't have to move. All you have to say is, "Look, I'm not really comfortable that your son's moving in." File an application at the landlord tenant board. We'll have a hearing. Your son can come to the hearing and we'll let the judge decide. You'll have to pay me a month's compensation. And if the judge believes your son, then the judge will evict me. If the judge doesn't believe your son, I can stay. Or if you want to give me five months rent, I will agree to go. I will sign an N11. Oh, thank you. But, but uh, if, you don't, if you don't want to give me money, that's okay. Yeah, I don't want to stay there, stay here, because in the pandemic, well, I don't, don't want to move out. But even if you don't want to stay there, if you move out, you have some power now. You have some power. Mm -hmm. The landlord does not want to go to the landlord-tenant board with the application because the son is not moving in. They can get fined by the board. It could cost them $70,000. So it's mm -hmm. better for you to say, if you don't want to live there, you can say to them, look, file an application. That's the system. File the application. There will be a hearing. Or I'm happy to move out at the end of August, but I want June, July, August rent free. And if you agree, I'll sign the N11. Mm -hmm. If I don't agree, say fine, file an application. And right now, I want to give him the, the, the rent check. 
but he refused. Sorry, you、and、want to I, give I, him what? I I want to give him the the check of the rent of this month. He refused. She do he don't need. But it's okay.、Rent. If just have have a witness, have a witness that you gave it to him. Try a direct money transfer. If the landlord says I won't take your money, not a problem. Just you know, make sure you write an email. You know the email says, "Dear Joe, I'm just confirming that I'm not moving out in accordance with the N12 notice, and that I've paid you the rent for May. And if you don't want to take my rent, that's up to you. But I'm not leaving." Oh, thank you, thank、and、you, you will so be much. Safe. Thank okay, you so much,、uh, Harry. No.、Problem. Hi, hi, Harry. Hi, who is this? Ah,、uh, this is Dong Mei. Oh, hi, Dong Mei. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Good. I just have a quick question. So, if this is a real reason that um, you know, say like a family member or my son wants to move in to to their house, is that a legitimate reason to kick out um, you know, a, a tenant and、it、maybe is. not happy? It is not sister or brother, only parent or child, one generation up or one generation down from the landlord, or you've sold your house and the purchaser, or one generation up, one ger- generation down, is moving in. But here's the thing, Dong Mei: you give the tenant the N12, the tenant doesn't have to leave because. If the tenant doesn't leave, just like with rent, just like with rent, you give the tenant the N four for rent, and the tenant doesn't pay, you file an application for a hearing. Same thing with the N twelve. You give the tenant the N twelve, the tenant says, "I don't believe you. I'm not leaving." You file an application. The problem is now, Dong Mei, that it's taking six months to get a hearing. Now that's not a terrible problem if my son is moving in. But it's a terrible problem if I've sold my house, and the purchaser thinks they're moving in. So don't ever sell a house guaranteeing vacant possession if it's tenanted without calling me first. And it doesn't matter what your realtor says because your realtor doesn't know the law, and you will end up in trouble. Basically, right now that it takes six months to get a hearing, you cannot. Sell your house where a purchaser wants to move in if there's a tenant, unless the tenant agrees to move. So what's happening now? The tenant knows that it's taking six months for a hearing, but the closing date on your real estate deal is June thirtieth. So now you, Dong Mei, the seller, you're in trouble, right?、Mm-hmm. You can't close. So the tenant says, Dong Mei, I'll leave. I'll sign an N eleven for fifty. Thousand dollars. Wow. Do not sell your house tenanted without talking to me or a paralegal. Do not let your realtor push you into the deal.、Uh, Perfect. Thank you so much, Harry. Thank you. You're very welcome. Anytime. Can a tenant have a roommate to share the cost? Absolutely. That's a great question.、Um, when a landlord says, "I didn't give you permission for them to move in." You don't need permission to move in a roommate, as long as you're not violating municipal or provincial occupancy standards, like so many people per square meter. Now, in condos, it's a little different, but for getting condos, you can move in anybody you want to live in your place. They don't have to be on the lease; they're just roommates. But you can move in a friend, a family member, a new boyfriend, girlfriend,、uh, mother, father, and they cannot charge you more rent. They cannot charge you more utilities if they're paying for utilities.、Um, it may not be fair, but that's the law. In condos, it's a little different because condominium corporations have their own laws on top of the RTA. In a condominium corporation, they're allowed to have a rule like only family members, only family units can live there, or that only two people can live in a one bedroom. Condos are allowed to do that because condos can make 
within reason, they can make rules. But in a regular rental, no, absolutely not. But landlords think that they can make the rules. Landlords think that they are the lord of the land. It's a funny word in English, landlord. It comes from the days when back in England, the king owned all the property. Uh, even if you had a house, the king ultimately had rights to the property. Uh, they were, and, and there were different classes of people and there were, well, look at, look at the cultural revolution in China. You had landlords uh, who were a class that suffered during the uh, cultural revolution. Many people think the word landlord is almost racist. Maybe not racist, but wrong, because it suggests that the landlord somehow has the right and the power to change the rules, to make the rules. In Ontario, they can't. The RTA and the lease make the rules. The lease has to agree with the RTA. That's why the government did their own lease, so that it wouldn't have illegal clauses. So that, that's the way it is in Ontario. It's a very equal relationship. It's not about the landlord having power. Any other questions? Thank you, Harry. Thank you. You're welcome. If there's no other questions, then... So, Harry, if you don't mind, <laughs> oh. I'm hesitant in not asking a question, but because I think maybe others need more time to discuss. But actually, my, my question is like, uh, I have a hearing scheduled. I'm a landlord. I'm a hearing student. I find an M4 and the final application. I got a scheduled hearing next month. So I just... Uh, I'm going to ask some, you know, maybe a little bit of professional questions. So how is the cross-examination uh -huh. in, the, in, the, in the hearing? It's a, almost the same as our criminal court? Like a, well, it is. And you, you know the court system. Yeah. Uh, you know, because uh, you work uh, in the provincial court. Yes. And the biggest difference, I suppose, is hearsay is admissible. Okay. They, they weigh it differently. Yeah. But the system of, and, and almost nobody uses opening statements. The applicant starts, they call their witnesses, they exclude witnesses that are not the, uh, uh, a party. There's examination in chief, cross-examination, re-examination, and closing submissions, just like there would be in provincial court. Okay. And uh, do I have to notify the tribunal or the other party um, in advance about the, the, the witness are going to call or just, no, just no. In the, in the if, if you have a hearing, if you have a hearing, you received a package of documents electronically. Yes. Before. Yeah. So you know you have to exchange documents seven days in advance. So, yeah, seven days. Yeah. Okay. The update sheet. You do not have to give witness lists. Okay. But you do have to exchange, and this is new since COVID, which is yes, a good thing. You have to exchange all documents seven days prior. It used to be just people would come to a hearing with a hundred documents. It's crazy. Now, <laughs> no mm -hmm. more. You don't okay. have to give them witness lists, but you do, or will say statements, but you do have to provide documents to the other side. Okay, so generally, how long it will take? I, I'm just wondering. I just rent, wonder. Rent, sure. rent? You know, the, the, the time, like two hours. Uh, I just wonder, like, if, if I if just, it's uh, if it's you know, go to cross examination too long, they if might it's adjourn about, to the next court date. So, Jeff, if it's about rent. Yeah, it's about tenor, rent. And the tenant owes the rent. Yeah. And there's no dispute that he owes the rent. And if, no. he, and if he's not blaming you about not maintaining, harassing, it might be. <laughs> well, then you might end up back on another day. See, if, if, a, if a landlord is a bad landlord, yeah. so doing any of those things I talked about, illegal entry, lockout, harassment, interference with enjoyment, uh, not maintaining, you are going to have a hard time winning your case at the landlord tenant board. So if the 
thing I can say to landlords is follow the rules because when you go to evict your tenant because he's not paying rent, if, if you come at things, the tenant can sue you. Now, Jeff, you're going to know, you're going to know if he's going to raise those issues because yeah. he has to get the information back to you. Yeah, I know. Also, I, I'm aware of what, you know, the, the documents she, he, she, they should provide to me. And also, I think that like uh, um, the issue is, is only about the toilet. It's not a big issue. And I uh, fix it. Maybe she's not that fine. So it's, that's the only issue. And, uh, you know, like it. Jeff here's, yeah. Jeff, here's all I can tell you today. Yeah. If it's about rent, it takes mm -hmm. five minutes. Yeah. If, it's, if he's got all sorts of claims and mm -hmm. you don't settle in mediation, and mm -hmm. you can go into mediation there, but if you mm -hmm. don't settle, it probably won't get heard that day. And the other question about she's a complete compl complaining about maybe the maintenance issue. Also, the other issue is like uh, um, my husband and I just lost a job. I can can pay. I, I wanted to maybe defer. So that's two reasons. So I I just wonder. So what kind of the, you know the facts that the, the, the educator were support her. That you, you're, you're, asking, uh, you're asking really more than I can tell you here. Yeah. <laughs> Except yeah. that if you're a yeah. landlord, you should have bought one of my packages, including a tent mm -hmm. hearing at the LTB. I mean, anybody okay. who's a landlord, mm -hmm. anybody who's a landlord with all these rules mm -hmm. should purchase this three pack to stay out of trouble. And then if you have to evict, these ones talk about eviction so you're looking for more information than i can okay <laughs> that's <laughs> fine <laughs> yeah okay, um, okay i would say get your hands clean if there's mm -hmm. trouble fix mm -hmm. it before the hearing okay okay uh emily emily says to me any new lease signed after november 16th is not under rent control no 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 it is under rent control if you are living in a building that was never first occupied as a rental before that day. In other words, if it was a new condo and the first person didn't move in until November 16th, no rent control. If it's a new condo, but the first unit occupied uh, for re residential purposes on November 15th, there is rent control. It has to do with when the building was built or really not built, but when it was first occupied for residential purposes. And this includes homes too. It's not just high rises. So this means uh, the, the landlord could increase the, the rate whatever they want. If this is a brand new building uh -huh. after 2018, then once a year, they can give you an N2 form, N2, mm -hmm. and they could raise it to a million dollars a month. Wow. Yeah, wow. I mean, and a lot of tenants, they move into these buildings. They don't know that the mm -hmm. rules were changed in 2018. And then they get a big surprise. Mm -hmm. It's bad. That's right. Um, Harry, I have an, another question. My daughter doesn't have the uh, lease right now, but we do. But she does live there, right? So she will she, she get the protection, she protection yeah. under the Tenancy Act without if, a lease? If she's not sharing a kitchen or a bathroom with the landlord or a member of the landlord's family, then she has protections under the RTA. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, do you see like those? Uh, how do you see the culture difference? Because you have many uh, Chinese friends. Sure. Uh, how do you see, uh, well, like uh, this culture difference? A, a lot well, of a lot of landlords, understanding. A lot of landlords get into trouble here. Mainland Chinese landlords, either who still live on the mainland, or who live here, because they think it's easy. 
they know it's a good investment. Everybody wants Toronto real estate, but it's so hard to evict a tenant that they do foolish things because it's so different. They, they rent to people without doing credit checks, without doing tenancy checks, without doing employment checks, without doing a Google search. And there is there's a guy named Syed, I forget his last name. He was in the papers a few months ago and he he goes after landlords, mostly Chinese in Richmond Hill and Newmarket and Markham because he knows they're not careful because they think it's easy. So he rented 15 different houses not to live there. And then he rents them out to $400 a month for a tiny space. And he divides it up into 10 rooms. So he's making $4,000 a month and he's renting it out for $2,000 a month. And he's doing it on 15 houses. So he's making $30,000 a month. And most, and most of them are Chinese landlords because, and, and I know I'm going to get some people upset if you're a realtor, they trust Chinese realtors to do these checks for them and they're not. And they don't, they're not careful. Uh, I have a, I won't say her name. I have a, a friend that I met through East West and she told me she was going up to Keswick or somewhere. She was meeting a realtor and going to buy a house for rental. And I said to her, do you know anything about the law here? And I said, don't do it. And she didn't do it because like, you know, there was a tenant there and everything. I like, I like the Chinese way. I like relationships, fast thinking, fast acting. It doesn't work in Ontario. I, I know in the mainland, people don't want to get involved with the government. They want to go around the government. They want to make it personal and they want to shake hands. When you do that here, unfortunately, you're looking for trouble. Uh, so you were talking about it's not, it's not, a, it's not a good idea to, to, um, to rent a house to, to be the landlord, right? It is, it is but it's a business. You, you can run a hobby like a business, but you can't run a business like a hobby. And in Ontario, being a landlord is a business. It's not terribly hard. You know, people buy my three pack and I'm not here to sell. I'm here to help. But they buy my three pack and they learn everything you need to know to stay out of trouble. So for an investment for a million dollar house, they're spending $249 to learn how to do it. If you don't do that, don't be a landlord because it's tricky. It doesn't matter if you're smart. It doesn't matter if you're successful. The law here is strange. It's not even really fair. It's a great investment because properties just keep going up. And I think they're going to keep going up. But be aware of the risks, rent control, how long it takes to evict, how many bad tenants there are. I mean, you know, interest rates are so, so low. So for people that don't own, their credit's probably bad. And I mean, now during COVID, there are so many people who've lost their jobs. So you need to do real careful checks on the people that you rent to. And you also need to be careful because, as you know, here in the West, human rights and discrimination are a big, big thing. Yang, I read something you posted, uh, translated the other today about microaggression. It was a, a fascinating read. And I think it's mm -hmm. true that maybe microaggression 
has gone too far. But in terms of discrimination here, you can't say I'm not going to rent to Jews or blacks or gays or whatever. And people get into trouble with that as well, because maybe where they came from, there wasn't those same human rights protections. But here you will get sued at the human rights tribunal and it will cost you a lot of money because the human rights tribunal, which is another court like the landlord tenant board, it is a very tough place for you as a business owner if you've discriminated. So mm -hmm. I'm not telling you who to rent to. If you don't want to rent to Jews or blacks or gays or Muslims, that's in your heart. That's your issue. But what I can say is keep it quiet. Keep it inside. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it to your realtor. Don't talk about it to other tenants because you will end up in big, big trouble. Well, you have the right to like somebody or don't like somebody, but uh, you cannot <laughs> express right. your dislike just because of, you know, race or color or nationality, whatever. You can look at their religion, financial yeah. history, mm -hmm. their, their credit, their tenancy history, their employment, but that's it. Any other yeah. questions? Or it's very different here for for landlords, and I'm talking today was more about tenants. Uh, but you asked the question for landlords, it's much riskier if you don't know what you're doing. Well, some uh, in COVID, uh, there are some uh, tenants were locked out, so the the landlords didn't allow them to come in uh, because of this COVID nineteen. If they say come back from China. Um, so they, so actually these, those landlords, if they did not share bathroom or kitchen, can't lock them they up. were actually, it's illegal, right? Correct. Uh, correct. You know, it, it's an interesting question. Let's say there's a house that's a duplex and there's two tenants upstairs and two tenants downstairs and the two tenants downstairs went to um, Shenzhen for a month. And let's say it was last year in March. And then they came back and they weren't quarantining and they were having friends over and the other tenants complained that they were in danger, then the landlord might've been able to evict them because of their behavior but you can't just change the locks. The only time a tenant has to leave is if there's an order from the landlord tenant board. If they were locked out, they can call, they can call a number. Right? The first thing you do and the numbers in the PowerPoint, uh, mm -hmm. you can call the Ministry of Housing's Rental Housing Enforcement Unit. They will call the landlord and they will say, hey landlord, you've locked this guy out. You're gonna be in big trouble. We're going to charge you with a provincial offense, and it could cost you $100,000 if you're convicted. Now, the tenant can go to the landlord tenant board, but that takes time. Mm -hmm. But if you don't let him back in today, we're going to charge you and take you to court. So the landlord lets them back in right away. But most tenants don't know about the rental housing enforcement unit. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's great resource, Harry. I'm going to make sure I send you the PowerPoint as a PDF and feel free to give it out to whoever you choose to. Okay, I'll share in our WeChat group. Um, and and also, I, I can send it out to all the participants tonight. Absolutely. Because I have a record uh, on Zoom. I can send it out. So don't ask me any more landlord questions because you're stealing, you're stealing information from two weeks from now. <laughs> Nobody will come back. Uh huh. Well, so, so uh, does anybody uh, have any question? Uh, I think there, there yeah, is Harry, a. Uh, oh, just go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I have one more question. Just a quick question about the deposit, uh, the key deposit. So, how much can the um, landlord ask for the key deposit? Is it reasonable to be charged for uh, 500 bucks? 
just for the the, the law says that on top of the rent deposit the last month's rent deposit the key deposit is the only thing they can take and it can't be more than the actual cost of the key card or fob so 500 okay. 500 is not reasonable I, I find 200 is pretty common you know for like in a condo key card fob 200 I, even that's like my condo, it's 70 bucks for replacement fob. A key you can make anywhere. Mailbox oh. key. Yeah, I see. Thank you. And um, so what if like the like if there's some damage to 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 the property, so how how how, how are they supposed to deal with it? Uh, so can the tenant ask the uh, has the tenant to to repair it or Who's responsible for, yes, for well, that? I'm, I'm, like, going talk, I'm going to talk about that when I talk about landlord remedies. But yes, you can serve the tenant a notice that he has to either fix it or you can take him to the board to evict him. That's a landlord notice and landlord application. But a lot, one thing that landlords don't do, and again, it's, it's a cultural thing. It's, it's not happening with Chinese landlords that come here, is you need to give proper notice to do a proper inspection every six months. You know, under the fire code, you're required to do a fire safety inspection at least once a year. CO detectors, smoke detectors, fire detectors. If you don't do that and there's a fire, or if you run an illegal rooming house, which many are doing, and people die, you can go to jail. You can spend time in jail. You need to give notice twice a year to enter for an inspection. One of those two needs to be an annual fire safety inspection. Both of them should be a unit condition inspection. And when a tenant tells you he's moving out and gives you an N9 form, or you insist he gives you an N9 form for June the 30th, then on June 28th, you need to give notice to schedule a move out inspection. When the tenant moved in, you need to take a picture on day one of everything, everything, every appliance, every window, every floor, every wall, everything. And you should walk around with the tenant and check off a form, which is part of my package. And on the last day or the second last day or the third last day, you do another inspection with the tenant, take pictures, and if there's damage, you sue him or her. But unfortunately, there's no damage deposit. Okay, I see. And what is considered to be a damage? Like if uh, the tenant has the pets and the pets get the wall a little bit dirty, but, you know, there's no hall, no other thing, just get the wall a little bit dirty, not that much is Emily, that considered Emily, a damage? You're, Emily, you're a landlord, and you're going to come to the session in two weeks, right? <laughs> but um, maybe she's a tenant. Maybe I'm a tenant. Her yeah, tenant, yeah. Her tenant I'm is tenant. complaining the, the about law, her cat. Maybe the law says reasonable wear and tear. Now, who knows what that is? Reasonable wear and tear. If you've lived there for thirty years is different from reasonable wear and tear if you've lived there for one year. But if I'm a landlord, if I'm speaking to landlords now, and Emily's lived there for five years, they should be painting the walls anyways. They should be fixing the holes from the pictures. They should be painting the walls. I think if a landlord doesn't do that, it's greedy. So a couple of marks from a cat, it's probably not reasonable wear and tear. So what a tenant should do maybe is fix it before they move out so that they don't get sued for it. Maybe you ask- Okay, I see. I, yeah, I see. So I wasn't in trouble, I'm just curious, thank you. <laughs> okay, and I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much, Harry. My pleasure. Yeah, we've learned a lot today. Okay, are we done? Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, any any 
other questions? Maybe last one for Harry, if you have, or otherwise uh, we'll call it a day. Okay, so. I really enjoyed it. And if anybody does want to connect and ask, feel free. And, uh, you know, I, I like helping. I'm sort of semi-retired now, trying to slow down a bit, but I still love helping people, you know, and so I don't mind. Can well, I ask thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Harry, Sorry. Thank, you for, thank you for your workshop. So I just have a question. So if the land, if one of the tenants uh, have COVID-19 positive, so does landlord have the right to refuse him to enter his house because there are any other tenants? He doesn't have that right, right? No, I mean, if, if he's already a tenant, you can't refuse him entry. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. okay. We'll see thank you. Two weeks. Well, thank you, Harry. So thank you very much, maybe Harry. Maybe i talk to you later. <laughs> yeah, really you appreciate know, it. But,